This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3261 Lecture 22C on the transformation of strains. Now in order to utilize completely what we're going to study today, we need to go back and remember what we learned previously about three-dimensional strains. It's easy to remember that the strain is simply stress over E, or the way I remember this is stress equals EE, -E, right? The modulus times the strain, and then rearrange that. But that's really only for a uniaxial load. If you have a multiaxial load, then the strain gets adjusted. The strain in the x-direction, for instance, is simply straight from Hooke's law, but as soon as you have the presence of a stress in the y and or z axis, you're going to get a little resisting strain due to whatever stress is in that other direction and that additional stress that either adds or subtracts is proportional to Poisson's ratio. We learned this before. The reason we're covering strain transformations is because the main time you will see that in your future student or industry work will be when we're trying to utilize strain gauge data where we align strain gauges along the lines of certain loads and then try and turn those back into predicting what stresses were in the material. In order to do that correctly, you need to recognize that if you have a unidirectional load, then sure, the strain is simply stress over modulus or the stress is just whatever that strain in that direction is times the modulus. But if you have stresses in other directions as well, you're going to need to make sure you use the complete form of the strain stress transformation. It's also useful to note what plane strain is. Now we studied plane stress before. Plane stress was just when the stresses are all in the same plane and there's one completely unstressed plane like the z direction shown here. Plane strain is similar and what that means is all the strains are in a plane and the strain out of plane or in one of the planes is zero as is shown in 747 here. Now the only way for this to happen, because if you have strain in the figure 747, if we have strain in the x direction and or in the y direction, that's also going to cause strain in the z direction, and that strain in the z direction is proportional to Poisson's ratio. So if we have no stresses in that other direction, that's a state of plane stress, but there will be strains in that z direction. If we actually want to impose a plain strain condition, what we have to do is keep it from straining. Remember that strain is change in length over length. That means for this to be a plain strain state, this element needs to be such that it can move in the x and y direction under the presence of forces, but it needs to be restrained so it cannot move in the z direction because a stress in the x and a stress in the y will both make a change in z direction dimension unless we hold the, the, the material like in this particular case if we hold it with two blocks and glue the, the blue element to the two blocks now and if we hold those two brown blocks in place it can't change the z dimension which means the strain will remain the zero in the z direction and that's a case of plain strain. There aren't a huge amount of structures which actually undergo this plane strain condition, but it's a useful idea for certain kinds of derivations of stresses. And that's what this slide is basically talking about. Now whether or not you completely understand this particular principle or not is not going to be real relevant to whether or not you can still master the things you need to master for this part of the lecture. The main thing that you're going to need to do from this part of the lecture is to be able to transform strains, specifically when they're associated with a strain gauge. The equation for transforming strain is analogous to the equation for transforming stresses, 
and we see that the strain in any direction is equal to the strain in the x, the strain in the y, and the shear strain with some trigonometric values interposed. If we look at figure 752 from Beer and Johnson here in the near the middle of the page, we see if we have the x strain and the y strain and the strain on this bisector from O to B, that's at 45 degrees, then this strain OB relation holds and the shear strain can be written more simply as shown here as 2 times the strain in the OB direction minus the x and y strains. And studying that trig a little further, we can say, well, given a strain in the X, a strain in the Y, and a shear strain on any element with any axis, we can calculate the corresponding normal strains and shear strain, which are shown with prime values here, by simply plugging the strains and the x, y, and the shear strain into these three relations near the bottom. Now we're actually not going to do this either yet, uh, but we're going to use these relations to develop some other relations. And you should be able to utilize these equations if given a problem like this. What this is saying is that we can actually do more circle for strains in the same way we did them for stresses. We're actually not going to do that in this class, but you should be aware that it can be done. This is the piece of information that all that prior information is building up to. Remember, since strain is related to stress, if we could actually measure the strain, and we can't really measure strain, but we can measure its change in length. We can measure a length of something and a change in length, or a dimension of something and a change in that dimension. And if we have both those measurements before and during load, we can calculate what the strain is in the part in that direction. It's just the change in length over length. Since it has been noticed that the change in length is proportional to current, a strain gauge typically will run a current through a thin wire and then look at how the resistance changes as a function of that length. And there are some things they can do to make these gauges more accurate by making the, gauge, the wire longer and longer and longer and making it thinner and thinner and thinner and flattening out the edges where you do turns of the thing to minimize the change in resistance in that area. This is a little picture, figure 763 from Buren Johnson shows what a typical strain gauge might look like. And basically all they're doing is evaluating that change in length by measuring the changes in voltage and current and all those kinds of things. Okay. Now what we often can do, we can take a single strain gauge and place them throughout a structure, glue them usually to the structure to measure the strain in various areas. And if we have a complex stress state, like if we want to know what the shear is, you can't measure shear quite as directly. And uh, in order to get strain in two directions, like if we have a a element with stresses in multiple directions, we would need at least two gauges. And if we want to get the shear strain, we're going to need a third gauge as well. Now, if we just say, okay, we're going to line these gauges arbitrarily, if we have an x and a y axis and put them at three rotations of an angle, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, as we see in figure 765 from Beer and Johnson, then the strain in any of those three directions are related to the strains in the original coordinate axes according to these three formulas. What this means is if we know the strain in the x, y, and shear strain on an element, we can immediately calculate the strains in any of three angles, three other directions, strain 1, 2, and 3. Now the problem is we actually are usually going to be putting gauges at three angles like this and we're going to be getting the three strains and we're going to want the strains on the x, y, and the shear strain. Which means we have to take these three equations and solve the system of equations to get the strain in the x, y, and z, not the other way around. Fortunately, 
most of you or all of you if you actually intend to become an engineer you should have an engineering calculator like the TI Inspire or a that equivalent level calculator which will all solve simultaneous equations you learned how to solve simultaneous equations in calculus and in algebra and should be able to do that but there's no point in wasting your time trying to calculate something that can be readily given to you by the standard calculator so I would get a make sure I would recommend that you get a calculator that can solve this if you get a problem like this you can just plug in your strains in the one two and three and what your three angles are and let your calculator calculate what the strains in the x y and shear strains are so you are expected to be able to do this if I give you three strains and three angle positions, like coming from three strain gauges, I expect you to be able to calculate the strain in the x, y directions and in the x and in the shear strain direction, and vice versa. That's the first thing we need to know how to do. And if we ever uh, end up in a place in industry where we're evaluating strains from uh, testing, these are the equations we can use to relate those. Now, if we happen to have our three gauges rotated, uh, placed in what's called a 45 degree rosette, that means we have a strain gauge in one direction, a strain gauge 90 degrees to that, and a strain gauge 45 degrees to that, then our equations get a little simpler. Actually, what happens is the shear strain is given by this relation that we saw before. Two times the strain on the bisector minus the other two strains gives us the shear strain, and actually everything gets a little easier. So this is a summary of the equations we have. We have these three transformation equations, which if we have strain X, strain Y, and the shear strain, we can just plug and chug to get the strains in the one, two, and three direction. And we can use these same three equations by plugging in theta, one, two, and three, and strain one, two, and three, and solving the system of equations to calculate strain in the X, strain in the Y, and the shear strain. Also, it's important to remember these stress relations, this is from what we covered earlier, that the stress in the X and the stress in the Y is given by these two relations. Our modulus can be written this way and our shear strain is written this way. These equations are handy and for some of the problems we might run into we're going to need to not only be able to calculate the strains but also calculate the associated stresses. And these equations for a 45 degree rosette, this is the most important thing. This is actually quite straightforward when we find a 45 degree rosette. We find the two principal strains, the strain in the two directions, are given by the first equation. And the stresses are given by the second equation. And the angle uh, of those is here as well. This is actually quite straightforward when we get a 45 degree rosette. This is a picture of a typical gauge. What kind of strain gauge is that? It actually is three strain gauges. You'll notice they've been placed at 0, 45, and 90 degrees. This is a 45 degree rosette. The typical kind of rosette that would be used to calculate to uh, provide the measurements of strains in those three directions so that we can evaluate all the strains both the normal and the shear strains at the point. What point are these valid for? Their point at where these three gauges intersect. So if you draw a line through these three gauges you find out they intersect at the upper middle of the corner where the arrow point is. That's the point at which these strain values are valid. Obviously, if the strain is changing significantly through the part, then you can actually get a slight error just due to the placement of the gauges. That's all I have for you. You now have three lectures for this subsection of the course. Make sure you study all three. Enjoy.